Welcome back to AOBO. I'm your host, Mr. Remke. In our first section of the vehicle related unit, we're going to dig into regulations related to vehicle equipment. In this particular lecture, we're going to use the interactive PowerPoint as well as you listening to me um, do the recorded lecture. So please open the vehicle equipment PowerPoint in a second tab, watch this recorded lecture, pause the recorded lecture when directed, and please click on the icons to go out to the links to websites or documents. If you see an orange square like this, it is going to take you out to a video link. If you see an orange square like this and click on it in the PowerPoint, it's going to take you out for more information to a website or another document. So kind of going to be a little more interactive than just listening last time. Please make sure that you have the PowerPoint open and follow along as we go. Okay, so what do we cover in this section? We're going to do a basic overview of federal versus state regulations related to vehicle equipment. We're going to talk a little bit about the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards and the National Traffic Safety Administration. Do a quick little um, overview of what the difference between a safety recall, a service campaign, and a technical service bulletin. A basic overview of the corporate average fuel economy standards and the new fuel economy labels. And then we're going to end this particular section in talking about the Wisconsin Statutes uh, Chapter 347 and Administrative Code Trans 305. Some very important documents to us as technicians in Wisconsin. So we're going to take a quick look. If a customer were to roll through the door with these particular tires, are they truly legal to be on a Wisconsin highway? Those headlight covers make that car look really cool, but would they be legal to be cruising down a Wisconsin highway? We're going to dig in and try to figure out um, those statutes and those regulations and try to determine if that is a legal or not legal item. Thrifty definitely looks like a technician that um, I would know be a thrifty repair, but is it an approved repair? Is that truly legal? All right, and digging in a little more here, let's talk about federal versus state regulations. Federal motor vehicle safety regulations apply most directly to the vehicle manufacturers. For a vehicle to be sold legally in the U.S. or imported and sold in the U.S., it must meet federal motor vehicle safety standards and regulations. And then we also have state regulations related to vehicle equipment. So states set up minimum, minimum equipment requirements to operate vehicles on their roadways. We're going to kind of boil this all down anytime we really deal with laws and regulations related to vehicles. Um, we're going to have federal and then we're going to have state. Um, we need to abide by both. Federal typically relates to the manufacturing of the new vehicle. States relate to operating that um, particular vehicle on their roadway. So as automotive professionals, we should be knowledgeable about federal and state regulations. We will often, uh, most often, refer to state standards to determine if the component or repair is compliant or non-compliant, but we also have to have a good knowledge base of federal regulations as well. Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards, acronym FMVSS, are U.S. federal re uh, regulations specifying design construction, performance, and durability um, requirements for motor vehicles and regulated automotive safety related components, systems, and designs. Big um, long story short there, um, it basically relates to the manufacturers and anytime they build a component that is put on an automobile, they must meet federal motor vehicle standards. Those standards are divided into three categories. So the 100 series category is crash avoidance, the 200 series is crash worthiness, and the 300 series are post crash survivability. Why don't you take just a few moments here and go ahead and click on the I link in your PowerPoint to go out and just skim through the Federal Motor Vehicle Standards document. I wouldn't expect you to read them word for word, 
but just click around in each one of the series and just kind of take a look and see what type of technical data, what type of things are regulated that get put on an automobile. When you're done, come on back to this recorded lecture and hit play and we'll go on to our next subject. So we'll, we'll take just a few moments and talk about the National Highway Tra uh, Traffic Safety Administration next. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is an agency of the U.S. federal government, part of the Department of Transportation. It describes its mission as to save lives, prevent injuries, and reduce vehicle-related crashes. They're charged with writing and enforcing federal motor vehicle safety standards, as well as regulations for motor vehicle theft resistance, fuel economy, all part of the corporate average fuel economy system. They license vehicle manufacturers and importers. They allow or block the import of vehicles and safety regulated vehicle parts. They administer the vehicle identification number system or VIN system. They develop the anthropic Big long word Mr. Remke can't even pronounce in his video. They basically make the crash dummies for the U.S. safety testing and they provide vehicle insurance cost information. A very important um, particular portion of the federal government that all relates to national safety of driving vehicles on the highway and making it safe for everyone to do so. Safety recalls are definitely terms that get kind of thrown out in the world. Anytime a customer has a problem with the vehicle, they want to know if it has a recall so they can try to get it fixed for free. A recall is issued when a manufacturer or the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration determines that a vehicle, equipment, car seat, or tire creates an unreasonable safety risk or fails to meet the minimum standards. Most decisions to conduct a recall and remedy a safety defect are made voluntary by the manufacturer um, prior to any involvement by the Ni National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. Manufacturers are required to fix the problem by repairing it, replacing it, offering a refund, or in rare cases, repurchasing the vehicle. Manufacturers typically issue voluntary recalls first to try to avoid mandatory recalls. When mandatory recalls are enacted, they're typically a little bit more strict, they're typically a little bit more harsh on the manufacturers, and ultimately means more money out of their pockets, and you know that's not gonna work out very well. So when you have a few moments, why don't you just take and click on these two links right here down in the right lower corner of your PowerPoint screen. It's gonna take you out to the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration recall website, and a frequently asked um, question document. Lots of good information in that document. When you're done perusing those two, come back to this video and start where you're left off. As a technician, like I said, that term recall kind of gets thrown out there pretty loosely. There is definitely a difference between a safety recall, a service campaign, or a technical service bulletin. A safety recall is issued by the manufacturer voluntarily or by the National Highway Transportation um, Administration mandatory when it is determined that a vehicle, equipment, car seat, or tire creates an unreasonable safety risk or fa uh, fails to meet those minimum safety standards. Repairs must be performed by a franchise dealer, so the recall must affect safety. Service campaigns, also known as an extended policy or a customer service campaign, are voluntarily issued by the manufacturer for non-safety related defects, typically to solve poor quality issues, defects, or pattern failures. Try to make a good word or a good name for our brand instead of have customers spread around that they have poor quality or inferior parts. They typically have a time and a mileage limit and they may have a reimbursement clause if the customer's already paid for the repairs. Service campaigns are focused on customer satisfaction and to avoid class action lawsuits, but they do not affect safety and they are not regulated by the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. Technical ser uh, service bulletins, or TSBs for short, are documents um, that recommend procedures for repairing vehicles issued by a vehicle manufacturer when there are several occurrences 
of an, an uh, unanticipated problem. TSBs can range from vehicle specific to covering the entire product lines and break down the specific repairs into a step-by-step -step process. TSBs may, be, um, may specify repair parts, some do, some don't, and the TSB will indicate whether it is covered under factory warranty or not. Let's just kind of kind of recap these. If a customer comes in and says they think they have a recall on their vehicle, there is a chance they have a recall, but it would have to affect safety and it's administered by the um, National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. Customers also may come in the door and say, I think I got a recall on my vehicle, and here it be for a service campaign, an extended policy, a customer service campaign. And there's a little difference there. They're not there for a recall um, repair. They're there for a service campaign. And technical service bulletins um, alert to technicians of repeat failures, unanticipated um, pattern failures. They may give details about mileage. They may give details about time that they're um, able to. The technical service bulletin may be actually explaining the service campaign as well, but we got to kind of keep these three safety recall, service campaign, and service bulletin separate in our mind. They're similar but different all in one. So how do we find recalls, service campaigns, and technical service bulletins? By far the most accurate source of recalls, service campaigns, and TSBs are the OEM websites. These sites are um, accessible to the franchised dealers, and accessing these websites in the aftermarket requires costly subscriptions. Going to be the most accurate information, but not available to all. Aftermarket service information, like all data, like Motologic, like ProDemand, is a good source of information, but it may have slower times or kind of be a little bit delayed in posting of the bulletins versus the OEM websites. And accessing recall information is very accurate on the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration website, but looking up service campaign and TSBs are up to the manufacturers to post those. It's kind of a voluntary um, posting on their site. So accurate for safety recalls, not so accurate for other items. Why don't you take just a few minutes here and check and see if your vehicle has any recalls. So what you're going to go ahead and do is click on the link right here and go out to the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration out to the recall website. You're going to go ahead and enter in your 17 digit VIN number from the vehicle you would like to check. Once you enter the VIN, any unrepaired recalls will appear. Okay, so you'll see those. When you're in there, if you click on the Learn More tab and scroll down, you'll be able to search Complaints, Investigation, and then go into Manufacturer's Communications. The Manufacturer's Communications are going to be where they house service campaigns and technical service bulletins if that manufacturer um, posted them on this website. So take a few minutes, go ahead and um, pencil your VIN number in and see what comes up. When you're done, come back to this recorded lecture and we'll move on to our next topic. Another item that the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration um, works with is the corporate average fuel economy standards. Those standards regulate how far our vehicles must travel on a gallon of gasoline or fuel. The National Highway Transportation Safety Administration sets CAFE standards for passenger cars and light duty trucks and sets um, fuel consumption standards for medium and heavy duty truck engines as well. Not in our realm, but just so you know, they also do regulate those. They also regulate the fuel economy window stickers on the vehicle. So for a little bit more information on CAFE standards, go ahead and click on this link. And when you're done, tune back into this episode of AOBO. Okay, and now that you've learned just a little bit about corporate average fuel economy standards, Let's take just a few minutes and learn about the new fuel economy labels that are on our new cars that are sold at the dealers. We have lots of different types of vehicles these days, gasoline, diesel, electric, hybrid. So the um, fuel economy stickers and labels have definitely evolved and been updated. I want you to go ahead and click on these two video links first. The first one is a minute 29 video through the, um, from the EPA. 
Video number two is about two minutes and 25 seconds and is kind of a Motor Week article. And then go ahead and click on that last link and um, you're going to go out to learn about the label website or fueleconomy.gov and you'll be able to peruse around and just learn a few more new details about those labels. Once you're done clicking on those two video links and the informational link, come back into this recorded lecture and we're going to move on to our next topic of Wisconsin um, Chapter 347 regulations. All right, now that we've kind of went through a bunch of federal regulations related to um, vehicle equipment, let's move into the deep, the nitty-gritty of the state regulations. Wisconsin, Chapter 347 of the Wisconsin State Legislator, uh, Legislature relates to um, vehicle equipment or equipment of vehicles. So Chapter 347 um, specifically covers the equipment of the vehicles, but all of the 300 chapters somehow relate to uh, um, equipment, vehicles, or equipment that would be um, eligible to be on a Wisconsin roadway. These are all administered by the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection, and they are enforced by the Wisconsin State Troopers, local municipal police, or county sheriff. The Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Con um, Consumer Protection is a governmental agency of the state of Wisconsin responsible for regulating agriculture, trade, and commercial activity in the state. The department is administered by a secretary who is appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate. If you'd like to get a little more information on the Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection, go ahead and click on this link here and tune back into the video when you're done um, hunting around their website. Another regulation that we need to become familiar with as a technician working in Wisconsin is Wisconsin Department of Transportation Code TRANS 305. So it's an administrative code related to minimum equipment requirements for vehicles operated on a Wisconsin roadway. The purpose of this chapter is to prescribe minimum equipment requirements for vehicles and standards for the equipment used on the vehicles, and that's verbatim right out of the TRANS 305 documents. This chapter includes equipment requirements for manufactured, homemade, street modified, replica or reconstructed vehicles, and motor vehicles including automobiles, light trucks, heavy trucks, motorcycles, motorhome trailers, and semi-trailers. To sum it up, it's applicable to most vehicles or equipment that would be operated on a Wisconsin roadway. It's not applicable to off-road use vehicles though, only on-road. So the Wisconsin Department of Transportation is a governmental agency of the U.S. state of Wisconsin responsible for planning, building, and maintaining the state's highways and some other stuff related to transportation. If you'd like a little bit more information on the um, Wisconsin DOT, go ahead and click on this link in the right corner, do a little perusing and a little hunting around, and come back to the lecture when you're done with that. So let's talk about TRANS 305, Enforcement and Penalties. No person may operate or allow to be operated on a Wisconsin highway any vehicle subject to this chapter that is not in conformity with the applicable requirements of this chapter. Whenever this chapter requires a lamp or device to be mounted at a certain height, the distance shall be measured from the center of the lamp or device to the level ground upon which the vehicle stands when such vehicle is without load. So really what that's kind of um, summing up, if you want to operate it on the Wisconsin roadway, it must be in conformity with TRANS 305. There are penalties, so unless a different penalty is provided by statute, any violation of this chapter shall be punishable as described in the um, Wisconsin State Statute 110.075 subclause 7. So why don't you go ahead and click on this link right here to see what you win if you're in non-compliance. Some of you might start shaking in your boots about the things that are on your vehicle. Ha ha. When you're done with that, Let's tune back in and move on to our next subject. So I know this has been a little bit of information that you've had to hunt around, and it may just kind of be blending and thinking, ah, oh, what's Remke on a tangent again about?
But um, let's talk about how these documents are truly used as a technician. So they would be used to understand the limits and regulations about vehicle modifications. If customers come in and want modified exhaust or want modified frames, these statutes and regulations are going to set up what would be compliant or non-compliant. So um, number two use, what is compliant or non-compliant for um, vehicles operated on a Wisconsin roadway? Kind of is it legal or not legal to be driving down the road with those tires pictured earlier? Is it legal or not legal to have the headlight covers on? Um, driving down the Wisconsin roadway. These are going to be our documents to come back and check that. The regulations apply to Wisconsin used vehicle disclosure and rebuilt vehicle inspections. So if you do buy a salvage vehicle and you want to um, rebuild it and make it a rebuilt, drivable, legal vehicle to be on the Wisconsin roadway, these are the standards and statutes that it must meet. Um, all related to um, equipment violation standards, all kind of summing up to is it in compliance or non-compliance to drive on a roadway. So your instructions about using these particular documents, whenever you want to look up a Wisconsin vehicle equipment requirement, both documents must be reviewed. You must review Chapter 347, which is from the State um, Senate, and you must review Trans 305, which is an uh, administrative code through the Department of Transportation. Chapter 347 sets up Trans 305 to be able to be enforced by the Department of Transportation. So what I'm going to sum this up, you um, have to read both. You could start with Trans 305 or Chapter 347 when you go to look these up. There should be cross links in the documents between um, the two of them. So if you start with Chapter 347 and there is some type of a Trans 305 regulation as well, there should be a cross link that you can click on and move to the other document, but you must check both. Whenever we um, read into these, have another person read the subsection, especially if it has tricky terminology. All of these were written by lawyers or at least reviewed by lawyers, so there are some really tricky wording in there. Two sets of eyes should always be better than one. Everybody is going to interpret these just a little bit differently, so it's good to have at least two people read them if there's some kind of gray area. And read the definition section for terms you do not fully understand. They will define what is a bulb, what is a uh, brake component, or what is a exhaust um, exhaust or a emissions control device. So please make sure you go into the definition sections um, if you don't understand a term. All right, let's spend just our last few minutes together going through a few examples of how Chapter 347 and Trans 305 um, could be used. So the first example that we'll go through is tires and wheels. So in this first example, we have our customer in for an oil change and vehicle inspection. During the inspection, the technician discovers that the tires are worn. All four tires are evenly worn, but they only have one thirty seconds um, of tread depth left. The service advisor prepares an estimate and contacts the customer. During the conversation, the advisor informs the customer of all the safety-related issues and states that the tires are below legal minimum specifications. The customer asks, well, how do you know what the legal minimum specs are for tires in Wisconsin? So we'll kind of dig in and show you that in the next couple slides. So in this example, I'm going to go ahead and start and review um, Chapter 347. Chapter 347.45 relates to tire equipment. When you go ahead and click on that um, link, it should bring up all of the sub-clauses or sub-statements that relate to tires uh, um, equipment. And this particular one, it looks like we have five separate subsections um, as part of Chapter 347.45. As you read through these, as you click on the link and go out to the website to get it more information, also um, down on the bottom, um, there is a cross link to go over to Trans 305.30. So anytime um, there are cross between Trans 305 and Chapter 34, excuse me, between chapters 347 and trans 305, you should be able to click on the link and jump right over to that other document. So why don't you click on the link right here on the arrow 
and read chapter 347 related to tires equipment. And then I'm going to go ahead and have you click on the link for trans 305.30 and review the material related to um, tire equipment. Once you've clicked on the link to go out to trans 305, you'll see that there are nine subsections to trans 305.30 that relate to tires and rims and basically explain all the legal parameters related to the tires and rims of a vehicle. If you haven't already clicked on that link and read these particular subclauses, do that now and come back into the video and let's do a little bit of a conclusion of this example um, when we get back. Okay, and let's go through a little conclusion then. So if you were to read through chapter 347.45, I do think that you would um, come to find out that technically we are compliant um, in this particular example. The automobile has tires filled with compressed air, no metal tires, no studs, or no chains as far as give, um, information's been given. So we can give them a check in the box compliant for chapter 347. Where we come into our non-compliancy though is with chapter um, trans 305.30 subclause 2. It clearly states in there the legal minimum tread depth in Wisconsin is 230 seconds. Our customer's tires are at 130 seconds, meaning that this vehicle should not be operated on a Wisconsin roadway until new tires are installed. Okay? The customer could face fines for the nonconformity, and you all know that this is a big safety issue. Um, the best solution is going to be replace all four tires, and at this point, most customers would, but we could basically, as a service advisor, as a service team, as a technician and as an advisor together, explain that really, truly, this vehicle is not legal to operate on Wisconsin Highway. It's not a good idea no matter what, but truly is in nonconformity. So we do tend to get this question um, towards the bottom. So what if we present all this information to the customer and they deny the repairs? Okay. The shop has no legal right to force the customers into the repair. We're going to dig into a little more details about repair practices in our next section of the course. Um, but just know that we have no legal right to basically force them. We cannot hold their vehicle hostage until they pay the $800 to put new tires on. All we can do is inform. Informing the customer of the safety issues, inform them of the nonconformity. If you were to get pulled over by a state trooper, they could basically um, put you in nonconformity, have you tow the vehicle to a shop, and give you a ticket and a kind of a penalty for it. So if they do refuse, document the issue on the repair order and have the customer sign it. That is legally as deep as we can go in Wisconsin. Some states would have some more strict um, policies or protocols we could follow, but in our um, particular state, if the customer refuses repairs that are in nonconformity or in a safety issue, they have that right. We can't force them to do the repair. But we would document down on there in great big bold letters and have them sign next to it that they are basically leaving our shop with an unsafe vehicle and in nonconformity. Some facilities may have the customer sign a waiver that's typically going to be in some of your bigger corporations, but you may need to sign a waiver that you're leaving with a non-safe vehicle. And like I said, we're going to dig into more details about repair practices and documentations in the next section of the course, so more information to come. And let's move on to example number two. This one will make a couple of the technicians um, reading this particular, um, or watching this particular lecture, kind of in, um, in tune, kind of open up their eyes a little bit. That's you, Caleb. Hopefully you're still awake looking at this because this relates to a vehicle you worked on, bud. All right, so example number two. A customer has his pickup truck in for diagnosis of multiple basic electrical concerns. The technicians perform a complete lighting inspection, and they determine multiple lights are inoperative, one of them being the center-mounted high stop lamp on the topper itself. So it was a vehicle really similar to this that had a topper. The light, okay, center high mounted brake light was inoperative on that topper. Um, the vehicle actually on the vehicle itself, so between the topper and the cab, that light worked, but it did not work on the topper itself, okay? So the young technicians asked their supervisor, well, do they legally need that light to work? During the discussion with the customer, the supervisor is asked the same thing by the customer. 
Does that light need to legally be functioning? So let's take a quick look at that, um, a little bit closer look here. So we're going to go ahead and start our research on this one back to chapter 347, um, subclause 14. Once you go ahead and click on this link, um, either up here at the top or down on the bottom, and read those um, subsections of chapter 347. And just kind of as a little note, look down on the bottom when you get there. This also has a cross link to go out to trans305.15. So you're going to um, go to the next PowerPoint slide and click on those links and read chapters 347 first and tra uh, trans305 second. So once you were done with chapter 347, you moved on to chapter uh, trans305.15. Let's go ahead and click on the link if you haven't already and read all of those subsections. And then we'll go ahead and um, when you're done with that and come back to the video and we'll go through a conclusion about this example as well. All right, so let's go through a little bit of a conclusion. So according to cha uh, chapter 347 and really specifically detailed into trans 305.15 subclause 5A, if the vehicle was originally equipped with a high mounted stop lamp and an obstruction is added like a topper or a ladder rack, the high mounted stop lamp needs to be remounted to make it visible. This particular topper had an additional high mounted stop lamp um, fixture already built into its structure like most would, so we didn't have to relocate it, but we did need to make sure that it was wired to the vehicle. This is a true example of what Evan and Caleb dealt with last year in basic electrical. During the inspection of the inoperative high mounted brake light, we found that the light had never even been wired um, from the vehicle to the topper. The customer bought the truck new, paid for the topper install, but he kind of got the shaft and nobody ever actually truly ran the lights to make the brake light work. So a few feet of wire, some solder and a little ingenuity from our two students, problem solved, and really, luckily the customer had never ever been stopped by Johnny Law for this non-compliant stoplight, but if he were, there's a potential that he would um, get some type of a penalty or some type of a fine. So legally need that light there and operational and visible. Let's go ahead and move on to our third example. In our third example, um, we'll kind of lead into the um, EGR delete. And really when we talk about this example, we are focusing in on an EGR delete, but we could replace any type of emissions control or air pollution control component. Um, or substitute it. Really all of these get grouped into emissions control devices. It wouldn't matter which one we are working with. This example would lead into it. So a customer owns a diesel powered van. The van was towed in because of lack of power. Vehicle will not accelerate. There's multiple warning lights illuminated and the vehicle's in limpid mode. The technician performs diagnosis and determines that the EGR valve and cooler need replacement. Exhaust gas recirculation is an emissions control system that brings inner exhaust gas back into the combustion chamber to control the formation of NOx. The service advisor prepares an estimate and it comes to about $2,800. <gasps> it's kind of what the customer says. So during the conversation, the customer asks, well, can't you just install one of those delete kits? So let's take a look and see. And like I said, really, we could replace any of the emissions control devices um, for that EGR valve. They all get grouped together. So in this particular one, I have a few links down here for you to click on. You can read into chapter 347.39. I'd like you to read into trans305.20. And just know that as you're reading through trans305, you're also going to be taken out to chapters um, 285.30 subclause 6. Um, then that's going to relate to volatile organic compounds and mobile sources, emission limits, and standards. So we're really going to have basically a few little crossovers and even some more regulations related to emissions control devices for you to research. Go ahead and do that research and come back to this particular um, portion of the video or recorded lecture and we'll move on to kind of our conclusion. Small note, there also is a link over to Trans 131 that relates to the Wisconsin Motor Vehicle Inspection and Maintenance Program. Basically this is the mandatory emissions testing program that 13 counties must follow in Wisconsin. We're going to cover more on this topic later in the course, but if you want to take just a few moments, click on it and kind of peruse around and just look at it. 
This basically sets up that inspection program or emissions testing. Not 100% uh, relevant for this particular example, but we will um, dig into those details later on in the course. See you in just a few. All right, and then let's go through our final conclusion. So trans 305.20 subclass 7 and 8 clearly state that all pollution equipment emissions control devices required by the Federal Clean Air Act shall remain installed, replaced with identical or comparable tested devices, basically aftermarket parts, and may not be removed, disconnected, or physically altered to be in effect. Okay, so when you read into statute 285.30, which relates to volatile organic compounds and mobile sources, um, you basically would have read in there that no person may fail to maintain in good working order or tamper with any air pollution control equipment. Subclauses C and D actually state that the owners could be ineligible to re uh, receive their motor vehicle registrations or could have the registration canceled or suspended for tampering with air pollution devices. And not only that, installing an EGR delete kit would also be a Federal Clean Air Act um, violation punishable by a fine of up to $10,000 per uh, offense. So as a professional repair facility, tampering with air pollution devices is probably not a wise choice. Possible state fines, federal fines, lawyer's fees, and would that benefit be worth the risk? Would it really be smart um, to save the customer money but cost yourself more money as a business in federal and state fines, it probably doesn't make sense. There are businesses that perform these installs, but for most of you that have ever tried to um, kind of get an estimate or look into this, they normally do it with a uh, waiver that says not for highway use, and my fingers are kind of doing the not for highway use clause. That's kind of risky. You're having them sign that they won't um, use it on a highway, but they're leaving your shop and driving home with it. That just sounds like kind of a lawyer or kind of a gray area. So to sum up this section of the um, AOBO course, there are a lot of re um, regulations related to vehicle equipment, some federal, some state. As a professional technician, we need to learn how to sift through all of them. Sifting through that is kind of like reading lawyer's terms but we want to be straightforward, we want to be accurate. If a customer comes in and they have non-compliant tires, we can use that as a way um, to prove to them that they should um, replace those tires. If they don't want to do it with us, but they want to do it with another facility, no problem, but they're in non-compliancy. If we don't know if a light should be operating or not, um, or if it's truly legal or not legal, we should look it up. If we don't know about deleting an exhaust component or um, looking at how we could replace or repair exhaust, we should look it up. We should always be looking it up and we'll um, kind of always be on the same page, which would be explaining the proper conformity or non-conformity and not giving opinions, but giving facts. All right, so let's use that knowledge that we just gained in the virtual lecture and kind of clicking on that interactive PowerPoint to do a few um, assignments related to the vehicle equipment section. So you basically have three of them in this section, due by Monday, September the 21st at 11.59. You're going to go ahead and post an article to this discussion board related to any topic we covered in this section. So if you want to do something about corporate average fuel economy, um, great. If you want to do something about vehicle equipment um, regulations, great. If you want to do something about the EPA window stickers for fuel economy, great. Find an article, summarize it, and post it on the discussion board. Or, in this particular section, you can post a question into the discussion board. If you had a question about um, Chapter 347 or a Trans 305 question that just didn't make sense when you were doing the research, post it on the discussion board and let's get a good conversation started between all of our classmates. You also need to reply to a um, classmate's discussion board post or question, so that's assignment number two and then you'll go ahead and complete the vehicle equipment regulations final exam. All of the answers for those um, exams are found on the links in this PowerPoint, in the interactive PowerPoint, so click on them to find your answers. As always, if you have any type of questions or you get stuck, shoot me an email, shoot me a text, um, give me a quick call, and I'll help you through it. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next episode of AOBO.